from the University of California, Morsi went to lead the Islamic Revolution as a member of the Muslim Brotherhood and became the president of Egypt. Why are these people esteemed members of our communities? Why? So I think, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll go back to the words of, of, Ed, of Elie Wiesel. Anti-Semitism is not only a Jewish problem or a problem for Israel, it, 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 it is, and it's exploding. But this is an indication, and I think history bears this out, of anti-democratic, anti-humane ideologies on the march. And once we permit the Jew to be demonized, once we permit the Jew of all people to become the epitome of colonialism and racism and elitism and apartheid, of all things apartheid, once we permit this, Ladies and gentlemen, this is not just the beginning of a conflict with the Jews. This is the beginning of the erosion of our democratic principles. It's true that anti-Semitism uh, uh, has an analogy of hatred towards other, other people in different countries. But anti-Semitism is not only the most old uh, uh, hatred, it's very plastic. It's changed its forms. It's went through different civilizations, through different cultures. And we can be successful in fighting against it. And we can be successful in learning lessons for the other races, the struggles against racism, only if you will see this connection. And that's why I see the importance of uh, ISGAF and our, our seminar and the work which Charles and his colleagues are doing. And what can be done during this seminar if we can build this deep connection between different types, types of uh, anti-Semitism, uh, and I hope it will help to each of you to build the uh, successful curriculum uh, attract, uh, fighting anti-Semitism on all the fronts simultaneously. Schools around Europe, as we found when we're doing this work, are guarded by security guards and with barbed wire and with security fences. In Turkey, it's not only guarded in that way, there is, a, there is a school bus that every day changes its code. The code is changed and the school bus has to flash that code in order to get in and there are bulletproof windows in the building. Now, yes, children are being educated, but Jews are being singled out that they need these security measures because the state can't protect them against anti-Semitism. And that itself is a violation if they want to go to a Jewish school, a violation to some extent of the right to education. In a word, we need to organize a global constituency of conscience, a global constituency of conscience to combat this global anti-Semitism. And this, in this global constituency of conscience, we need not only to condemn, we need to act. We need to implement, as I said, a national and international action plan and we must therefore now begin to not only speak up and stand up against this insidious domestic and global anti-Semitism, but we must act, for this is a threat to our common humanity. Thank you. It's important to see that in the 20th and 21st centuries, the two sides of this, the intellectual anti-Semitism and what I would call the street anti-Semitism, um, came together in the concept of modernity. And why did they come together? For the very reason that as, as countries became more democratic, more people had the vote, the upper classes needed to mobilize the, the, the masses. And anti-Semitism became, of course, a, a useful mechanism that you could, because it had this strong, intellectual philosophical underpinning which was very deep people who were christian could knew about deicide um and also the practical side and of course people like nietzsche the philosopher nietzsche already knew about this resentable the resentment of success my thesis is and it's not anything original is that what we have right now is in western europe and central europe is the Western and Central Europeans, I'm putting this, I'm engaging in a broad-based generalization, so put this in scary quotes, are, won't forgive the Israelis for the Holocaust. 
So Western European governments and, and Central Europe are so obsessed, pathologically obsessed, I would argue, with bashing Israel and demonizing Jew Israel. And that's largely, from my perspective, because of the Holocaust. So the reality is that anti-Semitism has greatly increased in the United States. Um, the um, Anti-Defamation League, which keeps track of these things, found that white supremacist propaganda hit an all-time high in 2020. It was a 68% increase just from 2019. So what you're seeing is a real dramatic escalation. And then I reached out to uh, you know Jewish communities because I wanted to be able to do a report that made sense to Jewish communities in terms of in terms of your understanding of where the, what the concerns were, and also what your understanding of what can be done by the UN. Fully mindful of the very toxic nature of the UN system in dealing uh, with issues linked uh, with Israel or with Jews in, in general. And of course, you know the UN system, um, while I would not say it's anti-Semitic is very hostile to Israel and therefore hostile uh, towards th things to with, with, I think, Jewish communities. And, and of course, you know, um, the whole subject of anti-Semitism, although dealt previously by the reporter on, on racism, um, was then ignored, but also by states directing that person to write in certain way, meaning focusing on Europe and neo-Nazism, was in my, in my view really uh, putting a screen on the very, very, if you like, you know, uh, complex nature of anti-Semitism. As Rosa mentioned, it was everywhere. I would, in fact, say it's not just radical Islam. I think Islam in, in very large, in very large part of the Muslim world, not just everybody who can be labeled radical Muslim, is exposed to anti-Semitic discourse in schools and elsewhere. And when specifically asked about the central purpose of 9-11, it was Osama bin Laden who replied, and I quote, to force America to end its support for Israel. His unambiguously stated aim to destroy Israel was inextricable from his contempt for the United States, the world's largest home to diasporic Jews, a majority of whom live in New York. Essentially, all the Jewish communities in the Arab world were uprooted. Most of them arrived, in the, meaning the poor, arrived in uh, Israel and became citizens of the Jewish state. The minority of them being the middle class and the wealthier Jews from Morocco, uh, Tunisia, etc., ended up in France or uh, in England. Uh, from Baghdad, they ended up in England and were reset resettled in the West. And thus the um, uh, Arab, the Jewish Arab refugees, um, the problem uh, also evaporated because they were absorbed and became citizens of other countries. Um, not wanting to go back to the Arab states, and this, of course, they are different from the Palestinian Arabs who want to go back to their homes. The Jewish refugees from the Arab lands don't. But in both cases, uh, the communities lost enormous amounts of um, wealth um, uh, as a result of uh, being uh, pushed out. And Yassin, who founded Hamas on December 9th, 1987. Uh, Ahmed Yassin suggested at the time, he said, our slogan he, he, is that killing Israelis, killing Jews, is an act of devotion. It's not an unpleasant necessity. It's not to get rid of the occupiers. It's to purge and purify the world of evil. Now, who is Hamas? They tell you in their in their charter. And if you want to say, well, they revised that. Nothing in the so-called revision contradicts anything in the charter. One of the hashtags that we saw surging with this campaign was COVID-1948, put out over close to 200 times per minute. COVID-1948 began trending on Twitter. The idea that the, that the Jewish state was a, a colonial virus that was seeking to replace dark-skinned people and take them over and infect them along with genocidal um, uh, depictions, again, by self-identified Iranian accounts. In fact, most of this was by self-identified Iranian accounts. People are becoming polarized. People are becoming radicalized to extreme or various ideological positions. How have they been doing this? How, how has this happened? I mentioned the otherization and the lens in the middle. We live in a world where whoever tells the best story 
gains the support. And we, as Muslims Against Anti-Semitism, did something, if you look on the left-hand side, we took a, an advert when, when, before we were actually formed as a charity last year, where we said, we Muslims have one word for Jews, and that's Shalom, and we had lots of Muslims signing at the bottom. During the conflicts, if you look on the right-hand side, we partnered with the JLC, the Jewish Leadership Council, and we actually issued this statement in probably 90 to 95 percent of all of the uh, UK major newspapers. What else have we done? Well, we've built these, we've created these leaflets where guidance for people on how they can have conversations about Israel, Palestine, Gaza without being anti Semitic. For me to see my father crying was the end of the world. I crawled to him, I took him by, by, by his. Uh, I took something off his uh, clothes and I cried to him, Father, why are you crying? Why, why are, you, are you crying? And he said to me, we don't have any more Rishik. Rishik was the name of my brother and he starved from hunger. We sit there and cry and cry and cry till we couldn't anymore. Before it was called Israel, the British still were here and uh, I did what my father asked me. I built our family together with Yossi, my husband, with my three children, my seven ranching children. And this is my triumph on the Nazis. It's going to be the very first um, course in, on anti-Semitism studies in uh, Bangladesh. So it would be very challenging for me. So I'm really hopeful about it. Throughout the academic year, we'll be sending out, or I'll be sending out, um, the most sort of up-to-date, balanced, fair, peer-reviewed um, articles, primary sources. Um, hopefully the ISGAP Resource Centre will be very helpful with this. Um, to try and sort of turn the volume down in this quite heated debate that we're finding on university campuses um, to try and offer clarity because I think that a lot of people when they um, create an opinion on something and they go looking for it on the internet they will eventually find it and it kind of creates this reinforcement um, so hopefully this will be able to change opinions um, and then, yes, like, as I said, at the end of the, end of the academic year, we'll repeat the survey and see if anyone has been convinced otherwise. People from a lower education background or students who do not have uh, a lot of awareness about international history uh, usually tend to use Hitler as a metaphor or rather as a caricature to represent something strict or something that scares them, um, which is a complete misrepresentation and I'd like to sort of change that in their minds and educate them about what exactly happened in history in terms of the genocide and in terms of the Holocaust to help them understand that he is in fact a terrible figure of inspiration and that he should not be taken as some sort of a, a fascist god to these Indians and as you see in these pictures people have had the habit of naming soap operas 
um, stores and even putting stickers on their cars after Hitler and his legacy. I'd like to do a small part in trying to stop this at least on a small basis and we'll hope that it carries forward. In the current 300 level undergraduate literature course I am developing with the aid of this institute, I aim to expand on that senior seminar and offer students a conceptual vocabulary to fight anti-Semitism in contemporary Spain and Latin America. To accomplish this objective, we will focus first on how the concept of raza was reutilized as a propagandistic tool by the regime of Francisco Franco to purify Spain from 1939 to 1975 and purifies in scare quotes. When you guys go out and teach students about these issues that there really is a, a vacuum, a, a blind spot in academia on these issues, the more we grow our network, the more publications, the more programming, the more students we can make a difference and uh, you know the time is of uh, as Ellie Wiesel said of great urgency if not an emergency so please stay in touch and really thank you for being here and thanks for all your contributions and making the program what it was so stay in touch and stay well and enjoy the summer the rest of the summer